Hey there guys, Navanat on No Limit Hold'em. Today we're going to be talking about dealing with your archetypical villain maniac. Your archetypical, run-of-the-mill, loose, aggressive, or hyper-aggressive opponent. I get asked the question, probably more than any other question, what can I do against an opponent who is really taking it to me, who is running me over? who is open raising relentlessly and barreling off and just putting me in a ton of tough spots and increasing my variance, boo hoo hoo. What can I do to adjust to this type of opponent? And in this video, I'm gonna explain my position on this kind of controversial subject that maybe doesn't have a pure consensus yet, but I bet you when you get to the end of the video, you will know what the difference is between a soul crushing monster and this dead money zombie. Really the difference is simply how we react to him. This dude over here, he wants to turn into this dude right here. He is poised to become dead money. It's just that people don't allow it to happen because they not only don't adjust correctly to the imbalances and problems with their strategies, but they actually very often adjust exactly in the opposite way that they ought to. If your opponent is a maniac, and let's first just start by quickly defining what do we mean by the term maniac. Well, let's just assume that when we're talking about a maniac, we're talking about a player that opens very wide, probably tends to size his bets a little bit on the big side, pre-flop and post-flop. He c-bets aggressively and barrels across multiple streets at a high frequency with big bet sizing. You know, he's just a guy that's in there plugging away, firing away, trying to uh, take down every pot and win every hand that he possibly can. He's playing too many hands, he's playing them too loose, he's playing them too aggressively. And what do we do? And the answer seems pretty simple, right? I mean, we just use the old adage, we fight fire with fire. Is that right? It's absolutely not right. A lot of players do this, a lot of players advocate this approach, and more players than advocated actually use it to deal with maniacal opponents, but quite frankly, every one of them is completely incorrect. The, I call it the FFWF fallacy, the fight fire with fire fallacy, is the first thing that really just has got to go. Get that out of your mind, and let's replace it with something that actually makes sense. While it's true that there is, on occasion, a situation in life where you fight fire with fire, usually, guys, usually, you don't fight fire with fire, you fight fire with water. In fact, the idea of fighting fire with fire wouldn't even be a thing that people say if, if it weren't so counterintuitive and so rarely the actual correct answer, right? There's no saying that we should fight fire with water because it just kind of falls into the no crap category, right? Uh, now, one thing I want to address just real quick, not going to hang out here for very long, but a lot of times when I'm explaining to people the way they need to deal with hyperaggression, they feel somehow, I think, unsatisfied. And I get inundated with all these questions. Well, you know, couldn't it be the case that villain opens so wide if he's opening 100% of his hands, for instance, heads up or uh, from the button in six max poker? Well, well, couldn't it be the case that I could just print money by three betting him because his range that he uh, is opening is just so weak uh, and wide? And, and yes, I mean, that could be the answer. That could be the case. Um, and some people are just kind of worried about, you know, how they construct their three bats and how often they ought to be three batting and things of that nature when they don't really have enough information to make those assertions or to ascertain those things. Uh, I, I've heard people say if I'm worried about getting four bat often because my opponent is a maniac, can I just polarize my three bat range? Well, yeah, sure. If you know that your opponent is going to play very four bat or fold against you, even in position, and he's opening 100% on the button, you could three bat a super polarized range, but you don't always know that. If we know he folds a lot, we can just inject tons of bluffs into our ranges and, and beat the hell out of them with uh, bluff-heavy 3-bet range, right? Well, yeah, that, that's also correct, but that is not covered or it's not detailed or outlined in the simple statement my opponent is playing maniacally. Not all maniacs are the same. And I get asked, well, if we don't 3-bet our opponent, aren't we just kind of allowing him to run us over? Uh, aren't we allowing him to open raise with impunity 
and always get to realize his equity, and yes, we are. But to his detriment, if we do it correctly. This is my favorite thing. People ask, isn't it true that three betting would discourage our opponent from being hyper aggressive? And so shouldn't we do that? And the answer to that question is yes and no. Yes, it would probably discourage him or could discourage him. And no, we don't want to discourage him. If our opponent's main mistake, propensity, the, the main way in which he likes to make errors is by being overly aggressive. Do we really think it's a good idea to discourage him from making the mistake that he most wants to make? Guys, poker should not be like that. You should not be constructing a strategy that feels like fighting fire with fire. This is not a game of chicken that we're playing. It really should feel more like surfing, right? Like, not like coming straight at the guy that's coming straight at you and trying to just, you know, impose your will. That's not what poker's about. It's not a game of chicken. I know that it used to be conceived of kind of like that. You would raise or three bet to take down the pot, then call for pot odds. And, you know, the goal used to be, we thought, uh, circa 2006 here that the goal used to be to win pots and we were locked in sort of a game of chicken but it's not that way and it shouldn't feel that way it should be more like uh, like the Bruce Lee notion that you should be like water Bruce Lee said when my opponent expands I contract and my opponent contracts I expand and when it hits I don't hit it hits all by itself right so we should think more like that now in order to beat a maniac Let's look at how they survive. I already talked a little bit about how they are sort of this poker game space version of the second law of thermodynamics, where everything just tends to fall apart. Hyper lag players are constantly bleeding off EV. If they're playing in a full ring game and they're playing 30% of their hands and they're opening way too uh, large when they do open and they're isoing everybody and they're three betting all over the place, they cannot be making mathematically sound decisions. And if they're not doing the mathematically or optimally correct thing, then they are bleeding money. And the only way that they can survive when they're bleeding that much EV is by every once in a while making a big score. The truth of the matter, guys, these dudes, these hyper aggro players do not win money so much from bluffing people off of all these small pots. I mean, really, a maniac is going to have the hardest time running a bluff. It's the tight, aggressive, or the nitty type players that when they do actually come out of their shell and try to win a pot with a big bluff, those are the guys that can print money with their bluffs. The real way that maniacs are able to exist and survive despite the fact that they're bluffing too much and playing too many hands and playing too aggressively is that they win larger pots than they should and that's not just because people do get stickier uh, because they should get stickier and it's not just because some of these guys have figured out how to value bet very thinly I mean that's a skill that's a skill edge that's something that they should get credit for the real reason that these people are able to be as successful as they are against a lot of different opponents is because their opponents are kind of helping them build these virtual coolers and then just climbing right on into them. Let's not do that. Uh, there's one basic and surefire way to beat a maniac. And I'm going to tell it to you, and it's very simply to starve them out. If left to their own devices without you interfering with your silly uh, artificial or virtual coolering of yourselves, uh, they would just die, right? They would just bleed out. Let them bleed out. What if I had a way to minimize our losses against loose aggressive and even maniacal foes or opponents? What if the adjustment not only lost less money when we were behind, but also caused us to win more when we're ahead? Very simply. Fold less often. That's probably super obvious, right? The part that's maybe counterintuitive or not as intuitive is you need to raise less, not more often. The way to beat a player that raises and bets and aggresses too frequently is to raise less often and fold less often. Of course, that's going to have you calling 
more often. That's what you need to do. That's how you win these games against these players. Uh, I don't know if you've seen my relative hand value line, Navinod's line. Uh, if not, maybe go back to the video. I think I called it adjusting against archetypical villains, something like that. You can find it on my channel. Uh, go back and take a look at this. I'm kind of proud of it. It's something I came up with by myself, and it really seems to work. Uh, the way that you read this line is from left to right, and you've got a pole on each side, and the poles on each side are incentive to aggress. So you've got aggression incentive on the far left, aggression incentive on the far right, and in the center, the dead center here, there is uh, less or maybe no, at the very dead center, there's no incentive to become aggressive. And this goes from nut value, like nutted value hands, to value hands, to showdown value bluff catcher type stuff, to draws, to air. Loose passive players, calling stations, shift your relative hand value to the left side of the line. So if you've got a hand that would normally be considered something of a value hand, you can play it more like a nutted value hand. If you've got something you might consider showdown value against a good winning rag, tag, or knit, you can shift against the loose passive player, the calling station, you can shift that closer to value. Uh, if, however, you're playing a draw against one of these loose calling station type opponents, you also need to shift that to the left and play it more like showdown value, and this tends to work. This, this usually works pre-flop and post-flop. Uh, against a tight nitty villain, that's going to shove everything over to the right. Uh, your showdown value hands all at once are going to pick up fold equity and they're going to be better used as bluffs than bluff catchers against players that don't bluff very often, right? So hopefully you get the idea or you've already seen it. Or if not, go back and look at it. But probably the coolest thing about this line, this Navinod's line that I came up with, is the fact that it also works for aggressive tendencies, but in a different way. If your opponent is playing very aggressive, then wherever your hand falls in this I don't know, overall equity distribution of this line, it should actually be pulling towards the center. Aggressive players that are betting and raising often, bluffing a lot, going for thin value raises, things like that, no matter where you are on the spectrum, they're going to start pulling you in more towards the center. If you're playing against a guy that's very aggressive and you've got a value hand, it could be played more like showdown value or bluff catcher because we're going to induce and call bluffs. If we have a draw, it's going to pull it more towards the way that we would normally play showdown value or bluff catchers because we don't want to get blown off of our draw. So this still holds. This is a fairly useful tool. Um, so again, how do we beat a maniac? We fold less often, we raise less often, we call more often. That's it. When we have a marginally strong hand, we can bluff catch by checking and calling very effectively against this type of opponent. When we have a nutted value hand, these players are the best players to slow play and trap against. When we have a strong but not nutted value hand, then we want to keep our opponent's bluff range intact and we want to avoid creating these artificial coolers where uh, we have top pair top kicker against a guy that's been raising us on every flop and we just say, you know what, he can't have it every time and we uh, three bet him and he four bets and we jam and we get it all in with one pair on the flop and in doing so, somewhere along the, the path we have chased out all of our opponent's bluffs and we leave him only with the very small percent of sets and two pair things like that in his range we lose all of our money we refuel this vampire of a poker player and then we go on and tell all of our friends about how we got so unlucky that the one time we finally had top pair top kicker against this guy that had been beating us all day, he just happened to have it this one time. It's not bad luck, guys. It's a bad way to play poker. Uh, I've got a couple examples, and we're just going to wrap it up. Now, queen jack suited can sometimes be three bet against a calling station type fish. For value, it, it, you, can, you can find a way to stick it into a merged or a linear uh, depolarized three betting range against players that are going to call you with a ton of hands that are dominated and just play poorly post flop. And sometimes if you're playing against even a, a good reg, you can find your queen jack of diamonds 
uh, in your three biting range for similar reasons, not exactly the same reasons, but similar reasons. Basically because you want to have a three bet range, you're out of position, so you probably should have a linear value merged range, and that linear value merged range has got to have a bottom, right? So the bottom is somewhere, and sometimes you're going to have that bottom at uh, queen jack suited. It depends on a lot of things like stack depth and whatnot. Uh, but anyway, against a maniac, you might be thinking, like this dude's raising 100% of hands. Surely, Queen Jack suited is strong enough to three about a guy who's raising 100% of his range. But if you're saying that, then you haven't been paying attention or you're not believing what I'm telling you. The correct answer against a maniacal player is to simply call. If we three bet him, we're going to knock out way too much of the bluffy, airy, crappy type stuff that we want to flop against. And we're going to have to, once we get called, take a flop out of position against a stronger range than we would have had to flop against had we just called. We're rarely going to get called by anything we dominate. And if he comes over the top of us, which is maybe not unlikely, it's, it's got us in a real spot. So let's just remember the cardinal rule here. Let's three bet less often. And so Queen, Jack, and Diamonds is definitely going to go into our flat calling range here. So we call. The flop comes down Jack, 7, 5, 2 tone. Uh, Jack of Clubs, 7 of Clubs, 5 of Hearts. What should we do? We should obviously check to the Razor. He bats. What should we do? He's going to have worse pairs. Uh, he's going to have draws in his range. And so on and so forth. But again, we don't want to check raise in this spot. Because even, okay, first of all, if our opponent had like second pair and we knew it, we would definitely not want to check raise him off, uh, potentially causing him to fold uh, a hand that we could have got value from on later streets. Like if he's got a seven, you know, often we're going to just be able to call him down. Uh, but if he, even if we knew we had a draw, which would probably be the best hand to check raise against, it's still not real clear to me that it's definitely better to check raise against his draws than it is to check call against his draws. This is exactly the type of player that could put you to a real decision when you check raise and he comes over the top of you with his draws, right? So that's not a good thing to have happen. Plus, we have to remember our opponents are gonna miss their draws more often than they hit their draws, right? And you know if they're gonna miss more than they hit and they're gonna continue barreling when they miss, uh, that also incentivizes us to check and allow him to continue bluffing. Uh, so even in the case where it's as clear cut as it could be that we should be going for uh, a raise rather than a call. That is, we know villain has a draw or draws in his range. It's still not clear to me that we wouldn't do at least as well overall by just checking and calling. Let's keep our opponent's bluffs intact and let's avoid coolering ourselves. And let's not allow our opponent to put us in awful situations where we end up folding the best hand too often. What about villain opening three times a big blind while we hold pocket nines? Again, I think it's a flat call very often against the uh, just the right type of uh, maniacal opponent. Look at these three flops. If you can get your head around why it's probably a good idea to check and call all three of these flops, there's probably nothing else to talk about here. If we have top set, we have a lot of incentive to check call because we have the deck on lockdown, we don't have to worry about any scary cards on turns or rivers, uh, and it's pretty unlikely that our opponent has a real good hand because we've got, you know, the top set. Uh, it's pretty hard for him to have two pair. Um, it's pretty hard for him to have. He just has fewer combos of strong hands on this discombobulated nine high board where we hold the two nines. Um, so. We want to give him a chance to bluff again. Uh, maybe we can look to check raise some turns, but honestly, against a maniacal opponent who barrels often, I think we do best to look to check raise the river, depending on stack sizes. Uh, what about the eight of hearts, five of clubs, four of diamonds board? Now, I can hear a bunch of people screaming that we need to protect our hand on this board. Well, no, we don't. What we need to do is allow our opponent to do the thing that he does best or worst, depending on how you're looking at it. We need to check and call 100% on this board. 
Uh, we don't want to check and raise, and we don't want to lead. We don't want to check raise and get blown off of our hand or get put in a weird spot. We don't want to cooler ourselves when we run into aces or we run into a set or we run into the uh, seven six here. Uh, we just want to check and call, keep them bluffing, and stop from coolering ourselves. And on the 10-8 deuce, now we've got probably what all of you would agree with as a chat call. We've got second pair, we've got some backdoor stuff that can happen. Uh, so this is probably the least controversial check and call. But if you understand that against this player it can make sense to check call a second pair, it can make sense to check and call with a very vulnerable over pair, and it can make sense to check and call with top set, and I really don't know what else there is to discuss. So I feel like I've done a pretty good job of uh, getting my point across in summary. The FFWF is a meme exactly because it's counterintuitive. The uh, FFWW would fall into the NSC category. Uh, did you follow all that? The fight fire with fire and the fight fire with water. If you're if you're not catching my drift, yeah, well, well, then you're lost and we're moving on. Uh, we need to know when villain, I'm sorry, we need to know how villain reacts to three bets before we can try to battle him in some exploitative way in this game space of three betting. It's not enough just to say that he's a maniac. We have to know how he four bets, how he calls, how he continues versus three bets, how he plays in three bets, uh, in three bet pots, etc., etc., how he constructs various ranges. With the information that we agreed on at the beginning of the video, uh, that would be a quintessential or archetypical version of a maniac. None of that information is in there. Uh, in the rock, paper, scissors of archetypical villains, player types, calls too often is greater than bluffs too often. Calls too often is greater than bluffs too much. So in the rock is greater than paper, is greater than scissor, is greater than that whole like rock, paper, scissor, non-linear hierarchy effect that happens in poker when it comes to various ranges, when it comes to starting hands, and when it comes to player dispositions or playing styles. In that rock, paper, scissors, uh, non-linear hierarchy, calling stations beat maniacs 100 days out of 100. To stay alive while bleeding off EV, through wide and weak ranges, maniacs have to win bigger pots than other people would win in their same spots with their same hands. Let's not allow them to do that. And the way we don't do that is to check and call more. We lose less than we lose and win more when we're ahead by virtue of not causing these virtual coolers and by way of not allowing them to take us off a hand very easily and by way of keeping their bluff ranges fully intact and giving them incentive to attempt barreling us off of the hand. Playing more passively and sticky keeps villain bluffing and stops you out, it stops you from wandering into the virtual cooler. That's it guys, I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time, Navanad over and out, good quote, L-U-C-K, end quote.